Hello, and welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you for listening to today's episode. This is part of a five-part series that I am doing on general health and wellness topics. That's kind of what we cover over here. I do a lot of interviews, but I've taken a break from interviews recently, and so I'm just doing this five-part series. The first part was sleep, and then I did nutrition, which was broken up into two different parts. So definitely go listen to those if you haven't listened to them already. Today is all about optimizing exercise, and then the fourth one will be optimizing your work, and then the fifth one will be optimizing your mind. So it's very general. It is a very good overview for people who are new to biohacking new to this idea of health optimization and really just looking to kind of like level up these different areas of their lives. I think this information is very foundational and then you can listen to interviews after these types of episodes to really build on this knowledge. Sometimes in the episodes when I have guests on and experts on, we're so in the minutia or it's such a niche topic that it could get lost in somebody who might not necessarily have the foundation of understanding how to optimize, you know, exercise, for example, in a very general way and like the different types of exercises and what you should be doing and how much you should be doing and those types of things. So sometimes it's good to kind of like peel it back and go back to the basics before we move forward. And that's exactly what we are doing. I'm excited about this episode. Like I said last week, exercise is likely the least knowledgeable area that I am in, in terms of biohacking, like the least I know, the I don't even know how to say that. (laughs) The least amount of information I know is about exercising out of all areas in health and wellness, I would argue. And I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's just how, you know, my, my passions have lied and my life journey has been so far. However, I would not be surprised if that were to change in the upcoming years. And I were to like do some sort of further education in exercise and fitness, whatever that might look like. Like I really said before, I just think biohacking is so holistic and encompasses all aspects of our health and physical health and exercise and movement is a very big part of that. And so I would love to learn more. So I actually learned a lot when I was doing research for this episode. And it always kind of takes me back when I read something and I'm surprised by it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm learning something from this podcast too. So I hope you are as well. This is also good timing because I am moving and in my new house, we are building a home gym. This is the first home gym I have ever built and I am very excited about it. And so going through this really opened my eyes to what I want to kind of be looking for and this idea of like the biohackers perfect gym. So I've been looking at equipment online and I will definitely be sharing that on social media and probably on here as well and linking to all the products I get or the things I do choose to buy because honestly, there's so much home gym equipment now, but finding equipment that is not super toxic and doesn't have a lot of plastic or off-gassing or those types of things in it is actually quite difficult. And then the stuff that is made out of like steel and wood only is usually hard to find or doesn't ship to Canada or is very, very expensive. So I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm <laughs> I'm looking around, I'm trying to find it. And yeah, the the gym itself will be pretty, I don't want to say basic because like I already have quite a bit of gear, to be honest. Like I have a Peloton. I have a bunch of yoga equipment. And so what we're really going to be doing is like laying down rubber tiles. We need a like incline bench and a squat rack and weights. Like those are the biggest three things that we need, the biggest purchases. And then making it look really nice. So like putting mirrors on the wall, putting hooks and also getting a sauna. So like there's all these different components to it, but that is kind of what's coming. And I am building that in May, which is really soon seen as it is March, which is crazy because I feel like life is flying by so fast now. So 
enjoy this episode. And before I dive in, a shout out to my people on my wait list for my Baby Steps course. Oh my gosh. So first of all, thank you so much for being on the wait list. Secondly, I know I said it would be out in February and it is now March. This course has taken me by the horns. I don't know if that's correct. It has been such a massive undertaking. And I mean that in the most positive, best way. I thought that it would be more of a condensed course. And then when I started writing it, I was like, oh, there's actually so much to say about each of these topics. So I am deep in it right now, continuing to write content for it. And it will be out soon for those people on the wait list. It will not be out publicly, I don't know, probably for another month or so. So it is coming. Thank you so much for waiting. I really appreciate it. Don't worry, you still get your discount. Whenever it does come out, you will receive a personal email from me and you will have access to it. And then you will also have lifetime access. So as I record the videos for the course in May and the podcast episodes and create beautiful like handouts and worksheets and add that all to the course to make it way more robust, you will get access to everything. So you are basically getting grandfathered in at a very, very low rate because it definitely will not be $2.99 ever again. It will likely go up. It's going to be $2.99 and then publicly it'll be $3.99 probably in a month or two. And then once all of the content is in, in terms of like videos, which are a lot of work, podcast episodes, everything like that, It's likely going to be closer to a thousand just because the course is again, so, so robust. This is a course that goes through preconception health for men and for women and looks at everything. So this is not just like a nutrition course that's like, Hey, follow this meal plan or this fertility diet. Like, no, it looks at substances, including like tobacco, cannabis, alcohol. It looks at exercise, like what we're talking about today. It looks at tons of biohacks and how they can support women and men in optimizing their fertility and preconception health. I'm talking things like acupuncture, vaginal steaming, red light therapy, cold therapy, hot therapy, like saunas. Talk about mindset. I talk about how to get your partner on board with you to like take something like this seriously. And then of course, there is the 90 day protocol that's a part of it as well. And this is really the fun part, to be honest. So there's the course and then there's the protocol. The protocol is the Baby Steps 90-Day Protocol. It's like for a minimum of 90 days and you follow this protocol and you do this before you start trying to conceive. And it is a select number of habits you do every single day. And it is to basically detox you and cleanse you and support your cellular health in all the ways. And it is going to make you the healthiest version of you possible. So it's my little biohackers cleanse. (laughs) I will put that in the show notes. Please join it. There's over, I don't even know how many are hundreds of you on there. And like I said, I will be emailing you and I just appreciate your patience because I don't want to put out anything into the world that I don't feel is a 10 out of 10. And then I just keep adding to it and it becomes 11 out of 10, et cetera, et cetera. So I, yeah, I really want you to get what you are signing up for. And I know the other thing I should note on this is that I know a couple of you have tried to book in client calls with me and sessions. I have temporarily paused seeing any new clients. This is because this course is taking so much of my time and effort and work. So. Once it's up and running and evergreen and it, things are kind of flowing, you know, in the next month, six weeks, then I will potentially open that up again and have my practice going again. But, you know, a few months from now for sure. But that is why I've just taken a step back is because I just can't do it all. And yeah, that's that. And a shout out to Bio Optimizers. You know, today we're talking about exercise. And I think it is important to mention that. Bioptimizers actually has a fantastic protein powder. This is the protein powder that I use. They have a berry one and a chocolate, and it is plant based, but it also has a ton of probiotics in it and digestive enzymes. So it is a really great, well rounded protein powder. I would argue that 
It's probably one of the cleanest ones I've ever seen on the market, which is why I use it. And my husband uses it in his smoothies every single day. We literally have tubs of it, like tubs. And so I love bio-optimizers. I recommend you try them. I love their digestive enzymes. I made a post about them on Instagram yesterday. You can go check that out. And I also use their magnesium and their sleep powder. I, yeah, I'm obsessed with their digestive enzymes. I have a bottle in my car and every like everywhere I go because I just feel like you never know when your stomach might start acting up or you're out to eat and maybe you're not eating the healthiest thing or you just want to support that digestion. If you're dealing with anything that's like bloating, constipation, like irregular bowel movements, or they're really smelly, or they're floating a lot, like all of those things are skin rashes even. All of those things are examples of poor digestion. And digestive enzymes can be fantastic for helping that and just like mitigating those symptoms. So that's bio-optimizers. You can go and find them in my on my website in the show notes. It's spelled B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. And my discount code is BiohackingBrittany in all capitals. Please use it. You will get the biggest discount possible if you use it, just so you know. So no matter what you see online, if you use the one that I give you, it is the biggest one. And so I try to do that for all of my brands that I work with. So enjoy this episode and I hope you learn as much as I did. All right, let's dive in. So exercise. Before we get into the different types of exercise and what to do and things like that, I really just want to talk about the importance of exercise in the first place. The significance of exercise to health and general well-being was understood early, early on. There have been so many scientific studies already that have looked at this. The WHO, which is the World Health Organization, has created global recommendations on physical activity for health which are based on extensive research. For individuals aged 18 to 64, which is like most of you listening, physical activity includes recreational or leisure time physical activity, transportation, occupational, household chores, thank goodness, because I love when my aura ring is like, oh, you did some activity and then I have to click housework, but doesn't matter, it still counts. Games, sports, planned exercise in the context of daily family and community activities. So that being said, this is what they recommend. So you can improve endurance fitness by exercising several days per week for a minimum combined duration of two hours and 30 minutes at brisk exercise or one hour, 15 minutes at strenuous exercise. Personally, I feel like those numbers are a little low from the who. Like I think that brisk exercise, two and a half hours. So that's like saying half an hour a day for five days a week. I don't know. I like I personally exercise more than that. And I think that is a little low. However, you know, maybe for somebody just starting out, that might be a better idea. In addition, improve muscular fitness and proper form at least twice per week. Additional health benefits may be achieved with five hours of endurance exercise per week. That's interesting, which means to say, which we're going to get into, that the benefits from exercise are exponential. And it's not simply, this is how much you get, no matter how much you're doing type of idea. I guess it doesn't plateau, but I guess we're going to find out. So according to studies, the health benefits of regular exercise include the following. Lowered risk of premature death coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, colon cancer, breast cancer, prevention of weight gain, general benefit in weight loss combined with reduced energy intake, improved condition of the cardiovascular and circulatory system, as well as muscular fitness, improved bone density, prevention of falling, prevention of depression, and improved cognitive function which is very, very interesting. I mean, like, I just feel like the list of health benefits goes on and on. So we can kind of look at a few different areas that exercise impacts. And one of the most important ones is the brain. As the saying goes, sound mind in a sound body. Most people are aware that exercise makes us feel better. Previously, it was believed that this was due to physiological factors only. However, 
Recent studies have found that exercise improves our brain function. According to the latest meta-analysis, exercise increases the amount of gray matter, particularly in areas crucial for memory functions, such as the hippocampus. In today's technologically oriented world, we have become alienated from our natural need to move, hunt, and gather food. In terms of survival, immature things have replaced physical effort. Oh, sorry, that does not say immature. (laughs) That says immaterial. That makes way more sense. I'm reading my notes here. I was like, I don't think that makes sense. It is tragic that it is precisely the lack of bodily exercise that makes us unable to deal with the challenges that cause an ever-growing amount of stress on our minds. That's very interesting. Hmm. Of all the medication used to treat people, the share of psychiatric medication has also grown dramatically. In 2000, scientists at Duke University published a study that compared the effects of the antidepressant cetraline, as well as exercise on cases of severe depression over the course of 10 months. Regular exercise was found to be more effective in treating depression compared to the medication. That is very, very interesting. I guess that kind of makes sense. It makes sense, but not that as many people do it, you know? A comprehensive 2014 meta-analysis found physical exercise to have a significant positive impact on various levels of depression. Exercise is recommended as a treatment for mild and moderate depression. According to meta-analyses, regular exercise also reduces stress, which is predisposing factor for various illnesses. Aerobic exercise in particular has been found to boost the production of endogenous cannabinoids, opioids, and phenylalanine. These chemicals probably contribute to the pleasurable experience of a runner's high. I definitely do want to talk about BDNF because I know BDNF is such a biohacker's (laughs) area. So in the book, in his book, Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain, which I have not read, John J. Rady, an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, discusses in depth the impact of exercise on the brain and on the mind. According to him, exercise has been found to increase the long term potentiation of nerve cells, improving the ability to learn and memorize. Similarly, BDNF protein, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor, levels have been found to increase after physical activity. This has a positive impact on cognitive functions. The most significant increase of BDNF in the blood was found after aerobic exercise and particularly high-intensity activity, which we're going to dive into shortly. Lastly, I mean, in terms of brain health, several studies have found that exercise reduces the occurrence of diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, as well as assists in the treatment of these diseases. For example, dance has been used to significantly improve the motor skills and quality of life of patients suffering from Parkinson's. The development of a child's brain, nervous system, and cognitive function to their full potential also requires regular and varied physical activity. I definitely want to make a note about the individuality of exercise, which I've kind of alluded to earlier. We can kind of see this here. A basketball player more than six seven six foot seven inches in height is unlikely to do well in ski jumping. Conversely, a lean marathon runner will not be a successful weightlifter. Humankind represents a diversity of sizes, strengths, and physical characteristics. It is therefore worthwhile to carefully consider the suitability of each type of exercise. What is my body suited for and what are my personal preferences? There are individual differences in recovery too. Generally speaking, women need more time to recover compared to men. And as we age, the recovery period grows longer. I just want to make a note on this. I 100% agree with that. I, whenever I do any type of weightlifting or strenuous exercise, you know, something different, new that I haven't done in a while, I will be the most sore on day two versus day one, whereas my husband is the most sore on day one. And it's always been like that. And so I don't know if my, like this is saying, my recovery time is slower, but I, no matter what is 
what type of exercise, whether I'm like squatting a lot of weight or it was a really intense hike or a really intense Peloton ride, anything like that, like anything that is like pushing my muscles beyond what they've been doing lately, it's day two for me is is the most sore. Because of this, a customized training program and listening to one's own body are key in maintaining and developing the enjoyment of exercise. Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five Americans aren't. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 300 biochemical reactions in your body. Today, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look for that could indicate you're magnesium deficient. Listen carefully to the end because there's a special offer happening and this could be exactly what you need. Okay, here we go. Are you irritable or anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you sometimes constipated? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency. So these are just a few of the most common ones. Now, here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem because most supplements use the cheapest kinds that your body can't use or absorb. That's why I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only full-spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb. All Bioptimizer supplements are best in class, which is why I use them. If for some reason you feel differently, you can get a full refund, no questions asked. They are so confident that they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. Just go to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany. In addition to the discount you get by using my promo code biohackingbrittany, you get gifts with your purchase. That's right. You actually get gifts up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. So act fast. This is a limited time offer. You can go to bioptimizers.com slash biohackingbrittany. Use my code. It's linked in my show notes on my website and start taking your magnesium today. I also want to talk about the social dimensions of exercise. So regular exercise affects the social behavior of the individual. People who exercise regularly generally have healthier emotional lives and more confidence. For children in particular, physical activity has been found to improve social skills. Exercising in a group also invokes team spirit and may improve communication skills. It is fascinating to note that rowers, for example, have a higher tolerance of pain in a group setting than when training alone. Indeed, team sports appear to beat individual sports in developing psychosocial skills and health. In addition to exercise, spectator sports have also been found to have health benefits. Intensive sports moments experienced and shared with others may strengthen social relationships. The social impact of spectator sports is much greater for men compared to women. Many people also consider watching sports an aesthetic experience, which, like art, may activate areas of the brain to do with aesthetic pleasure. Okay, now we are going to get into methods to improve physical performance. We're going to go through the different types of exercise, what one's the best, who should be doing it, how you should be doing it, and everything like that. So there are 10 different aspects, which is kind of surprising, but 10 different aspects of physical performance, not just one or two that you might've thought of right now, as I said that. So I'm going to briefly read them and then we'll go into them. So the first one is endurance. The second is muscular endurance. The third is muscular strength. There is actually a difference there. Fourth, mobility. Fifth, muscular power. Sixth is speed. Seventh is coordination. Eighth is agility. Ninth is balance. Tenth is accuracy. So starting strong, obviously we have endurance exercise. I think generally speaking, most of us understand what this is and how to kind of be in this zone. Endurance refers to the body's ability to withstand fatigue and remain active while under physical strain. Endurance depends largely on the performance of the respiratory and circulatory system, as well as the energy management in the muscles, i.e. their ability to convert fat and carbs into energy. This is determined by the number of mitochondria, the number of capillaries in the muscles, as well as various metabolic pathways. 
which we are not going to get into. So we're not going to get into metabolic pathways today and we're not going to get into anatomy because it just makes these episodes way too long. Endurance exercise is generally recommended as the basis of all healthy physical exercise, which is why we all know what it is. The recommendation is to exercise for at least two and a half hours per week. So exactly like I said, 30 minutes, five times a week. Some activities considered to fall under endurance exercise include walking, cycling, swimming, hiking, and even heavier housework and yard work. The intensity varies depending on the individual's fitness level. To make significant developments in one's endurance fitness, it is usually necessary to include activities more intense than walking, for example, running, cross-country skiing, fast-paced cycling, or various ball games. In terms of group exercise, various aerobics, dance, and cross-training classes are popular. Endurance exercise can be divided into four types by the level of exertion involved. Basic aerobic exercise, tempo endurance, maximal endurance, and speed endurance. Oh, I meant basic aerobic endurance. (laughs) Endurance can also be divided into either aerobic or anaerobic exercise. The boundary between basic endurance and tempo endurance is called the aerobic threshold. Similarly, the boundary between tempo endurance and maximal endurance is called the anaerobic threshold. Anaerobic, which means oxygen-free energy production, increases with the level of physical effort. The aerobic threshold is the level of effort at which anaerobic energy pathways start to be a significant part of energy production, usually under 70% of the maximal heart rate. The anaerobic threshold is defined as the level of exercise intensity at which lactic acid builds up in the body faster that it can be cleared away by the heart, liver, and muscles. For this reason, it is also sometimes called the lactate threshold, approximately 85 to 90% of the maximal heart rate. Once this threshold has been surpassed, more lactic acid is produced in the muscles than can be removed, slowly leading to fatigue. So obviously, both of these can be increased and improved. So for example, runners want to increase their aerobic threshold because this will enable them to run faster for longer. Maximal endurance refers to the level of intensity that ranges from the anaerobic threshold to the maximal aerobic exertion. There's a bunch of equations that you can do for this to figure this all out. I'm not going to get into the numbers because it's like reading numbers on a podcast episode seems a little silly just to listen to it, but we will continue with the basics of endurance training. So Key factors for endurance exercise that you need to know about. The majority of endurance training takes place in the basic endurance zone, so 70 to 80% of the training session. This develops basic endurance in general and cardiac output in particular. Focus on technique training. Training should be progressive in nature and there should be sufficient time reserved for recovery. High intensity interval training, known as HIT is particularly effective for increasing the number of mitochondria and the maximal oxygen uptake, which is known as VO2 max. And I'm going to get into HIT in a second here. You can perform various interval exercises in the tempo and maximal endurance zones. So you can do short intervals, which is HIT, which is 15 to 45 second, second exercise intervals. You can do longer ones with more rest in between. There's all types of different ways to do these types of things. Strength training increases the effectiveness of endurance exercise and improves performance. Perform restorative exercises and avoid overtraining. And you avoid overtraining by understanding your recovery time. So for me, it's two days. So if I lifted heavy two days ago, I'm not going to lift heavy the next day. I'm going to wait two days and I'll do something in between that's different. Maybe it's a walk. Maybe it's yoga. Maybe it is a Peloton ride, depending on the body that I was lifting heavy with. But if it was lifting heavy with legs, I probably would not be doing a Peloton ride or a cycling ride in general. So what are the common pitfalls of endurance training? So training at the same intensity level and heart rate zone time after time and training at the same pace time after time, training too hard on lighter training days or vice versa. So when I think of this, it's The people who go to the gym and go on the treadmill and do the same 30-minute treadmill walk 
maybe it's a jog or they're using the elliptical and they do the same workout every day a few times a week and that's it and then they leave. That is what that is talking about. There is no progression there. And so your fitness levels are never going to change if you're doing the same thing all of the time. Your body gets used to it, right? So we really have to think about adaptability and pushing ourselves in different ways so that we can always kind of be up leveling and optimizing our fitness. There are a ton of benefits when it comes to endurance exercise. I know we kind of touched on some of them. Endurance exercise has both functional and structural benefits. Structural changes include increases in heart volume and muscular strength, lung volume, number of mitochondria. Functional changes include lower blood pressure at rest, lower resting heart rate, and increased heart stroke volume and cardiac output. Endurance exercise is known to have a positive impact on anxiety and depression, balancing stress, and the treatment and prevention of numerous chronic illnesses. There are some disadvantages. So exercise and extreme endurance exercise may cause various health problems, in particular cardiac remodeling and increased arrhythmia are potential problems for people who are participate in marathon running, ultra running, and long distance cycling or Ironman training. It appears that the risk of coronary heart disease and the occurrence of atherosclerosis are also higher than those than usual for marathon runners. I think what's interesting about this is like, this is only really applicable to the very small subset of people who are taking endurance exercise to the extreme. So I think for the average person listening to this podcast, this is not going to be applicable to you. And I don't think that you should necessarily worry about that. A comprehensive survey study found long periods of walking to be a safer alternative to running while achieving the same health benefits, which is also very interesting. A lot of people are into walking these days. Hot girl walks, you know, it's all over, it's all over TikTok. Okay, the next most common one is strength training. Physical strength refers to a person's ability to generate a force or or resistance that one can apply to a given task. In practice, physical strength is determined by two factors, the cross-sectional area of a muscle as well as a muscle fiber volume and their contractile intensity. On the other hand, a person may be strong even if their cross-sectional muscle area is not large because force generation hinges on the ability of the nervous system to command, recruit, and organize the muscle fibers effectively. The basic principles of strength training. So to develop muscular strength, it is usually necessary to exercise the major muscle groups at least twice per week for at least 20 minutes at a time. Studies have typically included training programs of 5 to 15 different exercises. There are 1 to 4 sets per exercise each set consisting of 18 to 15 repetitions. So that means you want to be doing each large set of muscle groups twice a week for 20 minutes with various exercises. Some key factors. Perform exercises using correct technique and form. That is super, super important. Do not increase your weight until your form is correct. Favor multi-joint exercises, or sometimes they're called like compound exercises. So things like a deadlift, a front squat, back squat, pull up, bench press, dip, shoulder press. Over single joint exercises, such as bicep curl, leg extension, as the latter do not bring any significant additional benefits, strength and muscular mass. I always say this, I always think about this when I work out, is I try to do compound exercises. I just feel like I'm getting more muscle groups in than just simply doing a bicep curl. So, you know, like these, like these said, like the bench press is great. Deadlifting. I love deadlifting. I love straight leg deadlifts and squatting as well. And even shoulder press, like shoulder press, like actually combines quite a lot in the front chest and in the back. Progressively increase weight between exercises. Start, for example, with 60 to 70 percent of the maximal performance capacity. That is really interesting. I, Man, I have done so many different workout programs and I always find it interesting when I actually write down the weights that I use. So like 15 pounds, 20 pounds, whatever it is, and then go back the following week or the next week and try to do it again and increase my weight. 
there is something to be said about really getting into the groove and knowing your numbers and then being able to increase them compared to just walking into the gym and be like, oh yeah, like I think I can do 40 pounds. Oh yeah, that feels good. And it's like, meanwhile, you've done 40 pounds for the last three times that you've done it and you actually probably could push it a little more. So there is something to be said about tracking your weight for this. Progressively increase exercise volume. So you could do like more sets or more repetitions. You can also like obviously vary the time under tension. So when you're, you know, lifting it versus like putting it back down, or you can even change the recovery period in between as well. So how much rest time do you have? Is it a minute? Is it two minutes, 30 seconds? What is it? Which depends on so much, like how much energy you have, how well you slept, how much food you've eaten, all of those types of things. Change up your training program every one to three months. I naturally do this, which is probably part of why I've never fully gotten into fitness is because I get bored of the programs that I do exactly on this timeline, like every three months, every two to three months. So I have different apps that I use. I have different workouts that I use. I go to different gyms. Like I just, I do different classes. I just do all sorts of things. There are definitely like numbers associated with like maximal strength and things like that, but we are not going to get into that. The health benefits of strength training. It is associated with a lower risk of metabolic syndrome, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Conversely, reduced muscular strength increases the risk of metabolic syndrome and the associated chronic illnesses. A study published in 2015 found that strength training may also reduce the metabolic and cardiovascular health risks caused by excess weight. So that's a BMI between 27 and 30 to the same level as for individuals of normal weight. There's so many benefits. Like honestly, I there's so much research in this space in this space, which is awesome. So there really is the list really does go on and on. Regular strength training strengthens your bones, increases muscle mass and your strength helps in weight management, improves muscular endurance, and reduces the occurrence of any ailments. Regular strength training is also associated with increased life expectancy. So if you needed another reason to go lift weights, like there's just pick one. There's so many. (laughs) There's so, so many. Now the potential disadvantages Training using poor technique and excessive loads may cause repetitive strain injuries. This is a big one. We see this a lot with different workout classes that people do when they're not properly trained on what to do. Adverse effects of strength training reported in various studies include strains, muscle cramps, joint pains, and extreme cases, ruptured muscles or bone fractures. So some basic principles to keep in mind. Use maximal muscle contractions. The set length is 1 to 10 seconds. The set length is 40 to 60 seconds. Use three different joint angles per exercise. Make sure you're resting between sets using a ratio of 1 to 10. For example, 3 seconds of exercise, 30 seconds of rest. Isometric exercises may be performed alongside dynamic exercises. So here is a sample exercise that you could kind of do. So you could do. You could do a deadlift at six sets for a six second maximum lift. The bar must be heavy enough to not move at all. This is for maximal strength, maximal muscle tension throughout the whole entire body while you're doing it. A, another sample exercise we could look at is muscle math and strength endurance. So you could do a superset for biceps. So you could do three to four sets, bicep curl with a bar at eight repetitions, 30 second recovery. The isometric bicep tension is at a 125 degree joint angle times 45 seconds. So like I said, there's so many different ways that you can do this, but just understanding in general, this strength training, I think is really helpful to know. Okay, let's get into HIT. So high intensity training became popular among bodybuilders in the 70s. When sports equipment pioneer Arthur Jones developed a method to counter long, lower intensity exercises. The idea was to complete short sets at maximal intensity with short rest periods. So 
Hit is so, so popular now. I think most people understand it. It is defined as very high intensity exercises, 85 to 95% of maximal heart rate completed in interval form. The intensity of the rest phase is usually 60 to 70% of maximal heart rate. The length and number of the intervals vary widely depending on the training method. A typical example includes 30 seconds of action followed by 30 seconds of rest, repeated 8 to 10 times. Many studies involve observing a significantly longer interval cycle, for example, 4 minutes of action followed by 3 minutes of active rest, repeated 4 times. So I'll tell you what I used to do when I did HIT a lot, and even when I still do it now, it is typically on a treadmill and I will do a, two different ways of doing it. So one is one is running and I will walk on the treadmill for at like level, I mean, depends on the treadmill. So let's say it's like a speed walk, you know, like a level, I don't know, seven or something like that. And there's a bit of an incline. So I think I used to do three to six inclines. So there's a bit of an incline and it's a speed walk. We'll just call it like that. And then when I would go into my intense zone, I would put the incline down and I would like just sprint for one minute. And then I would come down. And so the sprinting, let's say, would be at a 11, 12, 13, whatever you know, I mean, I don't know, like there's different ones. There's ones that are like miles and ones that are kilometers, but that is kind of what I would do. So I would have whatever the maximum that I could do that I could work up to. And it would always be like one minute on and then a few minutes off. And that was what I found was very, very effective and very exhausting. The other way I also used to do that I used to see results with is I would do the same kind of thing. So I would do an uphill like speed walk at more of like a five incline and like a, yeah, I don't know, let's say again, like a six or seven was like the low time. And then when I would go into my high intensity part, I would put the incline up to 15, which was the maximum. And I would put the speed up a little bit. So I would not be running but the incline was very, very steep. And obviously you're not holding onto the treadmill. And that is also what I used to do. And that was really great as well. So I would kind of, sometimes I would do a session of running and uphill and alternate, which is a really good workout. Sometimes I do one or the other, but that was one of my favorite ways to do hit in a way that was not super damaging to my body, but also gave me really great results. It was really good for weight management, really good for endurance and just being able to keep up with things. It was, it was really, really effective. You know, I know some people do one minute on, one minute off, but man, that would be, that would be a lot, a lot for me. So you obviously have to take into account your personal preference, your individuality, because as a woman, I don't want to be over-exercising and I don't want to be doing too much hit that is, it's going to impact my hormones in that way. I don't currently go to a gym. So my hit right now looks like a Peloton ride. There's like hit rides on there that I do. And I just try to do my best with that. And I am totally fine with that. <laughs> but there are different other, like there are other hit methods, right? So there's like the Tabata method, which is popular, the sprint interval training, there's high intensity interval resistance training, and there's a bunch of different other ones that you can research if you're really into this and you're thinking, hey, I want to know more. Okay, let's get into gymnastics. So besides running and wrestling, gymnastics is one of the original forms of exercise. The word is derived from the Greek word gymnos, meaning naked or clean. These days, gymnastics is a sport that has been divided into various forms, such as artistic gymnastics and rhythmic gymnastics. I used to do rhythmic gymnastics, actually, when I was a kid. The goal of gymnastics is to improve physical strength, coordination, balance, agility, muscle endurance, and flexibility. From the biohacker's viewpoint, the top priority is to train a well-functioning body using simple gymnastic exercises. Artistic gym gymnastics is a particular useful resource for exercises performed on rings, parallel bars, a horizontal bar, or a pull-up bar. 
When started from an early age, gymnastics develops motor skills, general fitness, and cognitive and social skills. Gymnastics also develops the ability to adopt full body movement sequences, spatial awareness, and the ability to adapt to various synthetic stimuli, which is probably why it is so popular with kids. So basic principles of gymnastic training. One of the main physiological factors in gymnastics is the greatest possible force generation in relation to body weight. Great muscle mass alone will not ensure success in gymnastics. Moving one's body requires great relative strength. For young and healthy individuals, the correlation between muscle thickness and maximal strength is usually 0.5 to 0.7 in the lower limbs and just 0.23 in the upper limbs. So there's a bunch, there's so many gymnastic movements. I think like you might actually be incorporating these into your workout without even realizing that it's gymnastics, which is why I'm touching on it. So for example, like a bridge, you could do a pull-up, you could do a box jump, which are really popular at the gym, burpees, squats, hip shoots, hanging on a bar, different push-ups. You can also do cartwheels, headstands, handstands, like all of this, you know, it's also obviously in yoga as well. A tuck up, a V up, those things. There are a German hang you can do and other more difficult ones as well. Now let's talk about kettlebell training. You know, it's so funny. Every time I think about kettlebell training, I always think about Ben Greenfield because I just feel like I've seen so many videos or photos of him in his gym at home with his kettlebells. So there's just this like association in my brain now. But a kettlebell is an iron or steel ball equipped with a handle. Training involves ballistic exercises that improve strength, speed, balance, and endurance. It provides a hard workout for the hamstrings, pelvis, lower back, shoulders, arms, and the entire core. It is crucial to follow proper form. I love a kettlebell swing. I used to do them all the time when I was at this really nice gym. They are phenomenal. And also like they just get your heart rate up so much, so well, like so easily. So it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good mixture of everything. So the basic principles, as with other technique based athletic sports, you should familiarize yourself with the basics of kettlebell training before attempting the exercises. The basic techniques can be learned quickly. You should progress in the movements according to the difficulty level. So I'm going to go through some of the difficult ones and the easy ones and just be aware if you have shoulder or back problems. So the easy ones are like the Russian swing, the American swing, which I've done, deadlift using kettlebells, super easy. One arm kettlebell row, again, very easy. Goblet squat, shoulder press using a kettlebell. That one is a bit more difficult. Abdominal crunch holding a kettlebell with straight arms. That one I've done as well. Farmers carry, using kettlebells, slingshot, Russian twist. I think I've done almost all of those. The medium difficulty is a single leg deadlift using a kettlebell. That one feels really good. I I don't know why I love deadlifts so much, but I really do love deadlifts. One-handed kettlebell swing, push-up on kettlebells. I have not done that. Walking lunges, holding kettlebells. And floor press, push press, lateral scroll lateral squat using them as well. More difficult ones, if you're like, hey, I can do all of that, like challenge me. The Turkish getup, which is fun. I haven't done that in so long. I forgot about that one. I should do that again. A front squat with two kettlebells, clean using one or two kettlebells, jerk using one or two kettlebells, snatch or a thruster. Oh yeah, thruster is good too. Floor press in bridge position, overhead squat, and a pistol squat. Pistol squats are very difficult. I cannot do pistol squats. Okay, now let's get into natural movement. Okay, I definitely have to talk about natural movement because I feel like so many people would get mad if I did not. So natural movement refers to inherent types of human movement in various environments. However, many modern day knowledge workers are alienated from nature and mostly spend their time sitting in front of a computer or lying on a couch. That includes me sometimes. (laughs) Many others torment themselves at the gym using all kinds of machines, yet are unable to climb a tree or lift a heavy rock off the ground. Oof. 
So natural movement, there's different types. I think one of the most popular ones that we've seen lately is parkour. The history of parkour is similar to that of natural movement in general. Both originated in France and focus on the use of the body in various environments. Parkour strives for moving as efficiently as possible and navigating various terrains, usually in an urban setting. Parkour movements include running, climbing, hanging, swinging, leaping, jumping, rolling, and moving on all fours. Parkour significantly improves jumping abilities and various muscle skills. According to one study, the practitioners of parkour performed better than gymnasts in drop jumps and street jumps. Very interesting. Another aspect of natural movement is body weight training. So I think all of us have done this. There are so many common body weight exercises. The focus of body weight training is to improve strength, balance, endurance, and mobility. If the main goal is increased strength, body weight training should be combined with strength training done with weights. In body weight training, the intensity level is, in, is increased by completing more difficult versions of each exercise, unlike strength training where heavier weights are introduced to increase the workload. Increasing the number of repetitions or sets is used for both strength training and body weight training. That's very interesting to know. So typically, the body weight training exercises are divided into four categories, which is very similar to bodybuilding. So you have pushing exercises like push-ups. You have pulling exercises like pull-ups, you have core exercises like planks, and then you have lower body exercises like squats. Many body weight exercises not only work specific muscle groups, but also develop certain functional muscle tendon fascia lines. Many people use the term functional training or functional fitness now in connection with the body weight training as it creates an image of usefulness in daily life. Functional training appears not to bring any added benefits to the functionality of the body compared to strength training. The most effective strategy is to combine strength training and body weight training, which complement each other. That's really interesting as well. So some common ones that you have definitely heard of or done yourself, think like jumping jack, push-up, sit-up, step up on a to a chair, lunge, tricep dip on a chair. High knees running in one place, a squat without weights, push-up rotation, burpees, mountain climbers. I think we've done all of those. Next up, we have mobility training. Mobility refers to the ability to move the limbs and body through various ranges of motion without pain. A reduced range of motion of a joint indicates impaired mobility. Mobility, also known as like flexibility, is a basic physical characteristic and in practice, the basis of general physical ability. Children are a great example of normal mobility and flexibility. The modern life tendency to sit down to work that starts at school reduces natural mobility. Optimal mobility is crucial for the maintenance of good posture and the prevention of incorrect positions and injuries during exercise. By improving mobility, it is possible to also significantly improve the effectiveness and economy of various exercises. So obviously when it comes to mobility training, we can talk about stretching. So stretching can be divided roughly into three categories based on the desired duration. There is the short dynamic stretching, medium length stretching, and long static stretching. I am not going to get too much into the weeds about this because there's so much research behind stretching and I had no idea there was that much until I listened to Andrew Huberman's podcast episode on this. And it was fascinating. So I'm going to link that in the show notes. It's like a two-hour podcast episode on stretching. That's it. Like just stretching. (laughs) And I, I learned a lot from it. So essentially, like I said, there's the three different types. There's different ways to do them. And there's different benefits for each. So you really can improve your flexibility and mobility. And honestly, we should all be stretching daily, daily, which I do not do, which I should be doing. There are many different ways that you can stretch and improve these things. So yoga, there's different, obviously many different types of yoga. Pilates, which I've been doing, I've been doing reformer Pilates lately, Tai Chi and mobility training. So I would, what I would do is I would find something that works for you for a stretching routine 
and try to stick to it, whether it's an app, a class, or your own set of stretches that you do after or before a workout, I would find what works for you and stick to it and really just make it part of your daily routine. Because we sit so much in life now, it is so important to be stretching more. Like I literally just paused recording this to raise my desk so that I could now stand and move my body and stretch while I continue to record this. We also, when it comes to exercise, I do want to just touch briefly on breathing techniques. This is such a, breath work is such a big thing in the biohackers landscape. So I feel like I have to touch upon it. Various breathing techniques, for example, deep breathing may significantly reduce the respiratory rate and at the same time boost the respiratory minute volume, as well as reduce oxidative stress in the body. So there's different ways that you can do this. Again, I don't want to go too much into it, but one of the most common ones that people are doing right now is the Wim Hof method, which is, you know, he's known as the Iceman, has developed a method to control his automatic nervous system and immune system. He has many world records and, you know, he's crazy because he's climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in three days only wearing a pair of shorts. And I can relate to that because I actually have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro myself. And we did it in five days and I was in a, essentially a snowsuit. So (laughs) it was not a pair of shorts, let me tell you. And so he uses the TUMO method. I think I'm saying that right. The TUMO meditation and a breathing technique known as pranayama. There we go. A controlled study on humans has been published on the Hoff method. The test subjects were able to regulate the sympathetic nervous system and immune system using exercises developed by Hoff. After having received a bacterial toxin injection, individuals who had practiced the method had fewer flu-like symptoms compared to the control group, a higher adrenaline level in the blood, and a more constant level of stress hormones in the blood. The study also found that individuals who had practiced the method had a lower level of pro-inflammatory cytokines, whereas their anti-inflammatory cytokine levels were higher than in the control group. So there's other breathing methods as well that you can look into, like intermittent hypoxia training. There is crocodile breathing, which is thus named due to the position and breathing technique typical of crocodiles. Crocodile breathing trains the diaphragm, the body's main respiratory muscle. Deep abdominal breathing exercises may activate the parasympathetic nervous system and reduce stress. Abdominal breathing may also reduce post-workout oxidative stress and accelerate the recovery process. All of this, you can find way more information online if you are looking for it. Okay, next up, we have pilometric training which involves a quick muscle stretch followed by a very quick contraction. So leap and jump exercises are commonly associated with pilometric training, although explosive pilometric exercises such as throws can be used for the upper body as well. So some basics of this is the goal of pilometric training is to develop explosive speed of motion, activate many muscle fibers in a short period of time, and utilize the elastic energy stored in tendons. Pilometric training improves strength, muscle power, speed, coordination, and general athletic performance. It's also used for prevention of osteoporosis and improving bone density, particularly in young people. Jumping strength is best developed by combining several techniques, such as the squat jump, counter movement jump, and drop jump. Using additional weights has not been found to be of any extra benefit. So I've done some of these. I've done them in, yeah, jump squats. I When I've used the Sweat app, which is an Australian fitness app by Kayla Etzinez, I think that's how you say her name. There, she has a bunch of workouts that has this type of thing in it. And it is exhausting. It is a very, very, very good workout. When starting with pilometrics, start with the easiest jumps. Drop jumps put a strain on joints and muscles and should be left until later. It is a good idea for a beginner to start practicing the jump exercises in water due to its ability to reduce impact. That's a great idea if you have access to that. 
Okay, next up, we have cold thermogenesis, which is cold therapy, which I have talked a lot about on this podcast episode. So rapid temperature changes have several health benefits. Cold thermogenesis and the heat generation induced by it may boost metabolism and circulation and activate brown adipose tissue found in the back of the neck and the upper back. The purpose of the brown adipose tissue is to quickly generate heat. To do this, the brown adipose tissue burns conventional white adipose tissue. The activation of brown adipose tissue also increases the use of glucose in the energy metabolism of cells. Regular exposure to cold may increase the amount of brown adipose tissue and thus further boost this process. Therefore, cold thermogenesis may help in weight management, reduce the tendency to feel cold and improve cold tolerance. I 100% have felt this and seen this. The more cold exposure you do, the easier it is, the more you are used to what it feels like. Same with the colder that you do it as well. So there is definitely something to be said about the frequency and being able to withstand it. Feeling cold is a sign of the body temperature falling. The shivering reflex causes muscle cells to vibrate, which generates heat. This reflex is regulated by the hypothalamus. Cold thermogenesis activates the sympathetic nervous system. It constricts blood vessels in the hands, feet, and layers of skin to protect vital functions from the cold. Hypothermia occurs when the body temperature drops below 35 degrees. And this happens when an unaccustomed person spends approximately 15 to 30 minutes in water of 0 to 5 degrees Celsius, which is 32 to 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is needed? How are you going to do this? There's so many ways. And again, I've done so many podcast episodes on this already. You kind of need, you know, if you're going to do it at home, you need some sort of container and obviously water or ice cubes. So drink a glass of cold water before each practice session. Fill the container with cold water and add the ice cubes. Obviously measure the temperature if you can. Approximately 5 to 10 degrees Celsius is probably good. Set the timer for 30 seconds. 30 seconds is a great place to start. Close your eyes, draw your lungs full of air, and push your head into the cold water. So this is if you're, I guess, like dunking your head. I have done this many times. Repeat three times every single evening. Breathe deeply before the next repetition and take, you know, obviously be submerged for 30 seconds, like I said. When 30 seconds starts to feel too easy, you can start to increase this, but obviously don't go above like 90 seconds or a few minutes because like obviously you're going to need some oxygen because you are holding your breath. The next biohacker kind of way to exercise and that I want to talk about is electrical muscle stimulation, otherwise known as EMS, or it's called neuromuscular electrical stimulation, which is NMES, involves using electrodes to develop, deliver electrical impulses directly to muscle tissue. I have done this and it is a very crazy feeling when you do this. Yeah, it's I, I did it at a fitness studio and it was, yeah, it was really interesting actually. Similar to resistance training, it appears to cause muscle deterioration followed by an anabolic muscle repairing phase. This is the basis for the potential muscle building and force generation increasing efforts of the method. So this is not a new discovery. It's been used all over the world for a very long time. I just think it's becoming more popular and on social media now. It is quite expensive and you need quite a lot of tech for it. So this is the type of like training that you would do at a studio or a really nice gym or like even with a private trainer who has this equipment. Next, we can talk about whole body vibration. Again, this is such a biohacker way to think about exercise. I saw these vibration plates at the biohacking conference in June. I saw them at a, oh, I was at a gym. What gym was I at? It might have been in Costa Rica at one of the nice resorts we were at. There was a vibration plate there and I used it. And it was interesting because it's not something that I would ever buy for myself, but seems to be a very popular thing right now. So whole body vibration is a training method based on the tonic vibration reflex. It involves the use of a whole body vibration plate that produces vertical or rotational vibration. 
So it's literally like, if you've never seen one of these before, it's exactly what I'm saying. You stand on this plate and it literally vibrates your body and you can do different exercises while you're standing on it. Vibration training boosts lymphatic and peripheral circulation and improves the sense of position and motion. Improvements in bone density have been found in postmenopausal women. Indeed, the clearest health benefits have been generally recorded for individuals of advanced age. I honestly, I believe that's probably because those are the people who just generally use it. I just don't think young people use it. Another similar method that is kind of like this is rebounding. So rebounding is exercising on a miniature trampoline, has become trendy in recent years among health-conscious individuals, biohackers, etc. Jumping on a mini trampoline for just a few minutes significantly improves lymphatic and blood circulation and oxygen uptake. So maybe this is something that I need to add to my new home gym because I would never have thought to buy a little rebounder to kind of get the flow going. Effective exercises on a miniature trampoline include jumping, jumping jacks, running in one place, which sounds really hard on a trampoline, skipping on one foot, and jumping while maintaining various static positions. A particularly good setting for a miniature trampoline is at the office where work duties can alternate with pleasant bouts of jumping. Jumping on a miniature trampoline combines childlike playfulness with whole body exercise. Okay, I'm going to get a mini trampoline. I am convinced. Okay, last but not least, we obviously have to talk about my favorite thing in the whole entire world, which is sauna and heat exposure. So for everybody listening, if you know a sauna company that creates outdoor traditional saunas and they deliver to Canada, can you please send me a message on Instagram or email me? I am looking for a company to work with or a brand or somebody who I can just trust and like create beautiful content for, but also they create beautiful saunas. So right now I'm looking at two different ones. I'm not super keen on either of them. So if you know of a company and you're like, yes, they make outdoor traditional saunas, you should get this one. Seriously message me right now because like I'm likely going to be placing my order within the next week, two weeks, because because I have to for May. I really want to get it set up for May. So please, please the urgency is there if you're listening to this right now. There are two general types of sauna, the traditional sauna and the infrared sauna. There's actually more, but those are kind of the two main ones. The sauna baths are an example of a rapid temperature change to which our internal thermostat re- reacts in a way that is beneficial for our health. Traditional sauna boosts the production of growth hormone, improves metabolism, and increases oxygen uptake. Taking a sauna bath, which just means like going in your sauna, has been found to have a positive impact on the performance of endurance athletes. Sauna can also reduce joint pain, improve joint mobility, as well as ease the symptoms of individuals suffering from tension headaches. A link has been found between regular sauna use, so which is two to three times a week, and a significant lower risk of cardio arrest and coronary heart disease. The more frequent and prolonged the sauna sessions, the greater the benefit, which I love to hear because I love going in the sauna so much. Taking regular saunas also reduces the likelihood of catching a cold. And, you know, there's some people who say, like, the sauna is the poor man's doctor. Combining a sauna with a ice swim is, or a cold plunge is very popular now. And that is basically doing this hot, cold therapy that we're seeing. You know, it's all over wellness centers and spas. And I'm totally here for it. Like, I'm literally obsessed obsessed. The effects of taking a sauna bath are similar to those of physical exercise. It produces heat shock proteins that may have positive effects on muscle growth. Spending time in a hot sauna also appears to increase insulin sensitivity, which is beneficial for weight loss and diabetes prevention. So here's kind of like some finer details about how you want a sauna. And I have done other episodes on saunas before, so it's not the first time I've been talking about it if you're looking for more of an in-depth discussion. So stay in the sauna for a minimum of 15 minutes at a time. Two 20-minute sauna sessions in more than 80 degrees Celsius or 176 Fahrenheit with a 30-minute cooling break in between may increase the production of growth hormone two to five fold. The hotter the temperature, the greater the growth hormone production. So when I was (laughs) saunaing all of the time, my 
what I tried to do when I had access to a very good sauna, which has not been the case the last couple of years. But when I had access to a very good sauna, I would do 20 minutes in, come out for a few minutes and like usually do a cold shower and then go back in and I would do that loop three times. So so say my break was like five minutes and it was a cold shower. And so I worked up to that intensity level and would be dripping afterwards. It felt phenomenal. I felt so good. I used to I used to do all types of things. I used to stretch in the sauna. I used to meditate, visualize, work out all my problems in my head. Sometimes I would put a podcast on and that was in a traditional sauna. It was at a gym that was very nice that I don't live close to anymore. And then in the last few years, I've only had access to a steam room, which is kind of good, but not the same. And then also a home sauna blanket by higher dose. I will link the sauna blanket that I have in the show notes for you. It's great. It is nowhere near the same effect of a traditional sauna. However, if you live in a place where saunas are just not a thing and not possible for you and you want something more mobile, a sauna blanket is still a very, very good idea. Two one-hour sauna sessions per day may increase growth hormone levels up to 16-fold. That is a lot. That's two hours of sauna in a day. I've never, ever done that much. Yeah. So you can spend 15 to 30 minutes in the sauna followed by five to 10 minutes in a cold shower. When done two to three hours before bedtime, this will significantly improve sleep quality. And then you can also maximize your recovery and muscle growth by spending a minimum of 30 minutes in the sauna after exercise, which is why I think a lot of gyms have them is because of the research that shows Going in the sauna after exercise has a ton of benefits. So there's also the infrared sauna. Now, I know all the biohackers listening are going to say the health benefits are better for the infrared sauna. And yeah, you might be right, but I still want a regular traditional sauna. So (laughs) infrared saunas use infrared radiation, which heats body tissues directly instead of the air. The frequency of the radiation emitted by infrared saunas is like quite intense. The far infrared has been found to have tissue level effects, particularly on the mitochondria respiratory train in the cell energy production process and the blood supply of tissues by dilating blood vessels and improving circulation. So that's why so many biohackers and health optimizers will really talk about infrared saunas is because of the way that the radiation from it is impacting your body. It is penetrating your skin and your body deeper and you are getting those mitochondria benefits, whereas the traditional sauna heats the air and so it does not work like that. So in the for a regular sauna, in the past 10 years, many gyms and beauty salons have introduced infrared saunas alongside traditional saunas. An increasing number of people also install infrared saunas in their home to enjoy the health benefits. So other benefits of the infrared sauna, it reduces oxidative stress in the body, speeds up recovery from exercise, may reduce short and long-term pain, may promote the detoxification of the body through increased microcirculation and deep sweating. I like the traditional sauna, so I am going to stick to the traditional sauna. The traditional sauna actually heats up to higher temperatures than the infrared sauna. And what I have found personally is that because I have done both. I have been to many wellness clinics and they have, you know, had infrared saunas. And so it's not like I haven't used them. I find that the traditional sauna provides more of a mental release and stress reduction for me than the infrared sauna does. And that could be because the temperature is higher faster than the infrared sauna. So you go in and you're hotter faster. And so the you know, that heat shock protein that is produced occurs faster and is more intense. It's also like I am getting an outdoor sauna. And so to have an infrared sauna outdoors is actually very complicated and hard, especially when you live in somewhere like Canada where there's snow and rain. And so it doesn't really make sense for me to like invest in something like that with the conditions that I have. So I will be doing the traditional sauna which is going to be so nice. I've never, ever had my own sauna before. 
and I will not have to worry about all of the other bacteria that has ever been in there and I can keep it nice and clean. And so stay tuned for all of my updates on that. But that's it for exercise. I know this was long. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. If you did, I really appreciate it. Appreciate every one of you who listens to my podcasts. And I will catch you next week for another couple of episodes. And if you have any questions or you need links to products that I've mentioned, check the show notes. But if I don't put them there, you don't find them, send me a message on Instagram and I will grab them for you. My Instagram handle is at biohackingbrittany. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.